Welcome to the Library Channel from Arizona State University. I'm Fred McElvain. This is a three-part series on 40207, the Transborder Library Forum held at Arizona State University in February of 2007. Foro began in 1989 at a local Arizona library conference where librarians from the United States and Mexico discussed the need to create a network where they could meet and discuss issues of common interest while exchanging information and resources across borders. The theme for this year's conference is Bridging the Digital Divide, Crossing All Borders. Each episode includes one of three keynote speeches which addresses how libraries can facilitate access and exchange of information, resources, and culture through technology, Crossing All Borders. In part one, Janice Lachance, CEO of the Special Libraries Association and a member of the U.S. Delegation to the World Summit on the Information Society 2005 and the U.N. Internet Governance Forum in 2006, discusses her role with the Special Libraries Association and the role technology and the Internet play in the global library network. Our first keynote speaker today is Janice Lachance. She has been the Chief Executive Officer of Special Libraries Association since July 2003. She's a seasoned leader and communicator with more than 20 years experience in public service and governance. In her three years at SLA, she has guided the transformation of the association's core values and strategic plan and has overseen the creation of Click University the world's first online learning system for postgraduate librarians and information professionals. From 1997 to 2001, Ms. Lachance was the director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, OPM. Appointed to this position by President Clinton, she provided policy and program leadership for 1.8 million federal employees. After leaving OPM in 2001, she transitioned to a successful management consulting practice specializing in strategic planning and communications, human resource management, and organizational transformation for membership and nonprofit organizations. Ms. Lachance graduated from Manhattanville College in Purchase, New York, and earned her Juris Doctor degree at Tulane University School of Law in New Orleans, Louisiana where she divided her time between study and local politics. Ms. Lachance is admitted to practice law in the state of Maine and the District of Columbia, as well as the United States Supreme Court. She has used her legal training as an ever-present aid to clear thinking and to craft and interpret laws, regulations, and public policies. I welcome Janice Lachance. Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. And thank you so much, Sherry, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, the problem with being the host or the moderator is no one ever gets to say anything wonderful about you. So I'm going to take a moment here to just talk about what an extraordinary person Sherry is, a, an outstanding university librarian and a leader in the profession. I am particularly fond of her because I love people who are involved in their professional associations. And Sherry is the president of the Association of Research Libraries, and she has managed to guide a group of high-powered, smart, brilliant people who I would think always think they're right um, to um, some outstanding results both in the legislative arena and the programmatic arena and really is a, a model for all of us who are passionate about our professional associations. And speaking of people who are involved in their professional associations, I too would like to add my thanks to Jenny Mueller Alexander for the leadership that she has shown, not only in pulling much of this together along with her team, all the yellow lanyard people, so thank you for all of that, but also because uh, she is 
wrapping up her term as president of the Arizona chapter of SLA, and so I'm very grateful for her work in that arena as well. I'm very, very excited to be here with all of you today. This is my first foro. I hope at some point I'll get to the five or 10 or 15 that some of you are able to brag about, but I know that I'm going to enjoy spending time with all of you. There are a number of people here who are old friends of mine who've been involved in SLA for many, many years, and I'll enjoy spending time with them, but also making some new friends. I'm also going to try, try, because I get kind of excited and enthusiastic about this topic, but I'm going to try to speak a little bit more slowly out of consideration for the hardworking professionals who are offering simultaneous translation to some of the attendees. So um, for those of you who, are, who will be listening to the podcast, if things seem to get a little slow, just go ahead and take a nap and then come back to us when, when um, I, I speed things up a little bit. But I'm very grateful to have been asked here to talk with you about some of my thoughts concerning the United Nations sponsored discussions on the future development and governance of the internet. I was a member of the U.S. delegation to the World Summit on the Information Society in 2005, and I participated in the Internet Governance Forum under the UN's auspices last year. I strongly believe that the Internet has the capacity to transform and elevate women and men around the world in ways we have only begun to imagine. But much like the promise of space exploration or undersea exploration, the Internet's potential also depends upon our access to it and ultimately our stewardship of it. So before I begin to discuss where we are and where we're headed in regard to Internet governance, let me tell you a little bit about the Special Libraries Association and the role it plays in today's information society. We have members in more than 75 countries, so we are truly international in scope. And as many of you know, SLA is a nonprofit global organization for innovative library and information professionals and their partners, some of our sponsors and colleagues who are joining us here today. We serve more than 11,500 members in the information profession including corporate, academic, and government librarians and information specialists. The association seeks to promote and strengthen our members through learning, advocacy, and networking initiatives. We also try to play an active role in supporting libraries in developing countries, in training librarians and information professionals throughout the world. I'm proud to say that after the devastating tsunami in Southern Asia two years ago, the SLA Board of Directors formed a task force on nat natural disasters. The goal of the task force is to connect at the SLA community in times of emergencies and help fellow librarians recover from their losses. With investments of personal time, personnel, and money for activities around the globe, reflecting our values and concerns, SLA is committed to playing a leading role in ensuring the widest possible access to information in both a brick and mortar setting and over the internet. And this is the philosophy that drove my involvement and the involvement of SLA in the World Summit on the Information Society. Among the principal goals of WISIS which is how it's been fondly come to be known, was to bridge the div digital divide that separates rich countries from poorer ones by improving access to internet in developing nations. The digital revolution has fundamentally changed the way people think, the way we behave, the way we communicate with each other, the way we work, and the way we earn our living. It has forged new ways to create knowledge, to educate people and disseminate information. It has changed the way much of the world does business and the way many governments operate. And it has made personal and political speech much easier and much more democratic. 
It has provided for the speedy delivery of humanitarian aid and health care and has led to a heightened awareness of the need for environmental protection. It's even provided us with new avenues for entertainment and leisure. In today's world, access to information and knowledge is virtually a prerequisite for economic vitality and growth and has the proven capacity to raise the living standards of millions of people around the world. Now, while the digital revolution may have extended the frontiers of the global village, paradoxically, the vast majority of the world's inhabitants remain isolated from its benefits. As this gap between those with knowledge and those who seek it continues to widen, the fact is, so too does the gap between rich and poor nations and rich and poor citizens within nations. Recognizing this growing disparity between rich and poor, the International Telecommunications Union, a UN organization devoted to advancing the development of international communication technologies, decided in 2001 to hold a World Summit on the Information Society, our fondly known as WISIS, and place it on the agenda of the United Nations. WISIS actually represents a new approach by the United Nations to addressing complex international issues by not only involving governments, but by involving stakeholders at all levels. And frankly, I think we're going to see this more innovative model used to tackle some of the other international issues that we as a, as a planet are wrestling with. They're going to be different. They're going to be gatherings of all parties interested in making progress on specific issues. Sessions where government diplomats, industry representatives, non-governmental organizations, and members of civil society like SLA and academia can have a voice and take an active role in exploring solutions to thorny problems. Now it was determined that the summit would, be held, summit would be held in two phases, also rather unique. Phase one would take place in Geneva in 2003 and set forth an agenda. Phase two would be held in Tunis in 2005 where people would have a chance to look at whether any progress was made in two years and where to go from there. More than 11,000 participants from 175 countries attended the summit. These participants included nearly 50 heads of state and 82 ministers, as well as high-level representatives from non-governmental organizations and corporations such as Microsoft, AT&T, Sun Microsystems, and from civil society. When it was over, delegates had approved the Geneva Declaration of Principles and the Geneva Plan of Action, which set in motion a process for pursuing agreements on internet governance and financing and following up and implementing this Geneva Accord. As a result, the second summit was scheduled for Tunis in 2005. Now, though the process of international dialogue often appears to occur without significant controversy, because as you know, all the real talking takes place in the back rooms, and then when everybody comes out before the cameras and the microphones, things seem fine. The truth is, things often happen to threaten the outcome of negotiations. The WISIS process proved to be no different. In the period following the first phase in Geneva, several preparatory committees, everything has to have a shortened name, so preparatory committees are called PREPCOMs, and that's where the real negotiations take place. Several of those were held in order to talk about ways to streamline the proceedings during the upcoming Tunis phase. Now, a few weeks before Tunisia, however, Several nations, including the European Union, began calling for a shift in the way the internet is governed. 
Now, while we currently enjoy a fairly devolved structure of governance that allows for innovation and creativity to occur organically, these nations wanted to place control of the internet in an institution managed by all nations. There is no doubt this is a lofty goal, but personally, I think it's one that's fraught with peril. I know that the internet and the information it provides are imperative to all of us in this room. I also believe that creating a bureaucracy to govern the internet would have a profoundly chilling effect on the future of this technological wonder that has grown with a minimum of government interference. Now, given the overwhelming desire amongst most nations, NGOs, and the private sector to lower barriers to access in developing nations, the last thing I thought we needed was a political and bureaucratic apparatus that could weigh down the most democratic and open communication system that's ever been invented. As a result of this, an additional series of PrepCom meetings were scheduled in Tunis for the three days immediately preceding the opening of the second phase of the summit. Right at about this time, the U.S. State Department put out a call for people to serve as public members of its delegation in Tunis. The U.S. Library Copyright Alliance, which is comprised of SLA, ALA, Sherry's Organization, ARL, and two other U.S. Library Associations, recommended me to serve as its representative as a public member of the U.S. delegation. It was truly an honor to be selected by my colleagues in the library community and subsequently by the U.S. State Department to participate as a full member of the delegation. However, because I am no longer a government employee, my role was purely consultative. I had no way of knowing whether my views would be solicited or even wanted by those who were actually involved in the negotiations. The rules said that I could not negotiate or speak for the U.S. government, but I could advise and hopefully influence the negotiators. And I'm very, very pleased to report that the U.S. negotiators were, in fact, very open to my suggestions and comments. So after becoming a member of the delegation at the 11th hour, I made quick plans to arrive in Tunis as soon as I could which was the evening of the first day of these last-minute PrepCom meetings. Unfortunately, the first thing I noticed was that the exposition hall, where the summit was taking place, was still in the final stages of construction. It seems that the Tunisian government had not counted on the PrepCon meeting and thought they'd have three days to get everything wrapped up. So with the last minute scheduling of the PrepCom, the hardworking people of Tunisia were placed in an unenviable position of hosting a major international event before their facility was completed. So as a result, those of us attending had little access to food, only a handful of soda vending machines, and a very, very crowded hot room with no ventilation. So if you think that didn't motivate people to get things done. <laughs> now, the primary topic of debate among the delegates attending the PrepCom meetings was the future of internet governance. As many of you know, the United States is currently home to the internet and ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. As it turns out, many nations perceive these naming and numbering activities as tantamount to controlling the Internet. Yet the dominant influences on the growth and development of the Internet are the private sector and academic innovators who are involved. And though its record is far from perfect, the U.S. government has done little to impede the progress of the Internet's growth. Now, in spite of that, a number of nations saw WSIS as an opportunity to take control of a resource that SLA and many others believe should remain free from any government or political influence, 
and take it to a, a new location, physical or uh, just new or different, we're not sure, but to a new forum that would administer it. And they knew they had to make their case at the PREPCOM. Now the U.S. delegation, along with a number of other nations, recognized the importance of giving all peoples of the world a voice in the future of the Internet, but also believes in an old saying you may have heard, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So the U.S. delegation, in my opinion, was very persuasive and did an excellent job of addressing the needs of the developing countries while resisting calls from those who wanted to impose a more structured governance on the Internet operations. The PREPCOM lasted three very long and very hot days. There were some sharp and pointed comments and dozens of private meetings among the delegates of the nations who were represented there. Each paragraph of each document was discussed and amended until agreed upon, and work was finally completed after 11 p.m. on the third day, the eve of the opening of the summit. Let me tell you, the restaurants and the tea rooms, and I dare say the bars of Tunis have never been busier than after the close of those prep comms. They were filled with delegates from around the world celebrating the successful conclusions of the negotiations. After that, the summit itself was mostly a formality, as most of the serious issues had been resolved during the prep comm. There were eight plenary sessions and a number of workshops from morning till night over three days where the views of delegations, NGOs, and civil society representatives were discussed and formal agreements reached. The outcomes are contained in the Tunis Commitment and Tunis Agenda for the Information Society, which was adopted November 18, 2005. Among its provisions was language recommended by the U.S. delegation on very important matters to all of us, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and the free flow of information. I'm proud of the fact that I had a voice in shaping this language. I felt these proposals were particularly important for the global community of librarians and information professionals because many governments today seek to be the sole source of information for their citizens. SLA members I know, and I would dare say all of you, rely on the internet as a source of critical information for decision makers at the highest levels of government and nonprofits, as well as the executive suites of the world's most successful corporations. Without access to current, reliable, in uncensored online information, they would be very much like carpenters without nails. It's important to remember that authoritarian regimes that attempt to control the information their citizens see, read, or hear are not the only impediments to free and open access to information. As I've already mentioned, internet access is extremely limited in many countries due to the lack of a technology infrastructure. It makes it virtually impossible for large numbers of citizens to access the extraordinary wealth of information and data that can be found online. Then there's the thorny issue of intellectual property rights and international copyright law that looms over the internet like a digital sword of Damocles. Whatever the cause, impediments to the free access of data and information have profound impact on both the human spirit and on the evolution of people's abilities to solve their problems through reason and innovation. As I look back on the summit in Tunis, perhaps the single most important outcome was an agreement to create an internet governance forum, allowing all stakeholders to gather and discuss the overarching issues surrounding the internet. This new body, which will meet once a year through the year 2010, will not be involved in domain naming or 
day-to-day -day technological and administrative issues. It will, however, give all nations and stakeholders an opportunity to voice issues of concern without interfering in a system that, for the most part, works well. This collaborative, inclusive approach is crucial to the future of global information sharing and advancement. So the first meeting of the Internet Governance Forum took place in Athens in November of last year and focused on four broad themes. They were openness, including freedom of expression, the free flow of information, ideas, and knowledge. Second was security, with which they defined as creating trust and confidence through collaboration. The third was diversity, which is promoting multilingualism and local content. And the fourth was access, internet connectivity, policy, and cost. The debate at the conference was both spirited and constructive. The issues are complex and far-reaching. And I'd like to address further the important issue of unfettered access to information. SLA firmly believes that the internet and its underlying technologies must remain open and transparent to ensure the free flow of uncensored information and ideas. It's only through this free flow and transparency of information that accurate corporate organizational and government decision making can occur. It's the foundation of a robust global economy which will provide opportunities for all, especially those in developing nations. Information knows no natural or political boundaries and with the rapid improvements in technology will continue to be increasingly available despite the best efforts of content controllers who wish to restrict information for their own political or commercial reasons. Most of us would probably agree that content providers deserve a system that delivers appropriate rewards for their intellectual property and motivates them and others to provide more and more of it. But I think we would also agree that our global society needs, needs timely and affordable access to the best thinking of our best minds in order to address the most pressing issues of human health and welfare. Information must not only benefit content controllers and the owners of intellectual property, it must serve the human needs of the billions who, as former President John Kennedy described, inhabit the small planet. I believe this is one of the moral imperatives of our time, and history will judge me and you sitting in this room and all the rest of us involved in these issues on our ability to accommodate the competing interests of artists, intellectuals, and entrepreneurs with the needs of all global citizens. I'm sure we will see a great deal of debate, negotiation, and compromise on this issue in the years to come. But even after the global information economy has accommodated different rules, guidelines, and le legislation for efficient operation, it will likely continue to be the focus of intense legislative debate and costly, time-consuming international litigation. And as I said before, balancing the needs of individuals with the needs of a growing information society will become paramount. That's one of the reasons I would like my colleagues at upcoming Internet, Governant for, Internet Governance Forum meetings to consider a set of goals that were developed by the Library Copyright Alliance. The Alliance, which I mentioned earlier, monitors and advocates for the fair use and application of copyright laws. They propose these goals for the international development agenda of the World Intellectual Property Organization. The goals set a clear path for advancing libraries and information centers as major sources of information in the global information age. The first goal focuses on a robust and growing public domain, providing new opportunities for creativity, research, and scholarship. 
It talks about public access to works created by governmental authorities, access to published works with regard to government-funded research, and not subjecting copyright-like protections to facts and other public domain materials. The second goal looks to effective library programs and services as a means for advancing knowledge. This goal speaks to the copying and migration of content into new formats for the purpose of preservation, lending, network availability, conversion of material for persons with disabilities, and the copying of material still in copyright. The third goal encourages high levels of creativity and technological process resulting from individual research and study. This deals with copyright laws so as not to inhibit the development of technology, permitting the copying by individuals for personal research and study and technology circumvention ex exceptions. And the fourth goal deals with harmonization of copyright. This goal recommends refraining, refraining from the overriding of established copyright practices with other bilateral or multilateral agreements and stresses that goals and policies agreed upon are important statements of national and international principle and should not be varied by contract. These principles not only set a tone for the advancement of libraries, they provide considerable wisdom about ways to address the growing intellectual property debate. Again, I think this is something the IGF should take a good close look at. So where's the debate about internet governance headed next in the diplomatic arena? A recent IGF stock taking session held in Geneva may give us some clues. The purpose of the meeting was to assess what worked well at the first IGF meeting in Athens and what should be changed for the upcoming meeting in Rio de Janeiro in November. By and large, attendees were pleased with the innovative character of the IGF and with the need for a preparatory process in advance of the meeting. Some, however, called for additional transparency and there was general approval of the meeting format where participants created a useful and beneficial space for dialogue among all stakeholders, not only government representatives. Participants liked the focus on the specific themes I mentioned earlier and the use of professional moderators to keep the debate flowing and to make sure that all points of view were aired. The use of multi-stakeholder multi workshops was also praised, as was the concept of dynamic coalitions, which came out of them. Dynamic coalition sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They are thematic networks that can help facilitate discussion among stakeholders in between the meetings and they can be created and can have membership that fluctuates on an ongoing basis. They can come and go, they can be active or dormant, and it really is a place for people who care about a particular issue to spend time together during the time when the Internet Governance Forum is not in session. I'm currently a member of two dynamic coalitions coming out of the Athens meeting one on intellectual property and one on open access. One of the biggest concerns of the attendees was the limited participation in the IGF by representatives from developing countries. In addition to discussions of ways to expand remote participation, there was talk of the need for donor nations and those in the private sector to do more to encourage the participation of those who lack financial resources to attend. Perhaps the discussion of greatest significance at the stock taking had to do with the future of the IGF itself. A number of participants would like the IGF to do more than merely solicit stakeholder views and educate the public. Clearly, there is pressure to expand the role of the IGF and allow it to provide formal policy recommendations for future consideration. I think it's fair to say those pressures 
are likely to increase with time. Also, as a result of the creation of the IGF, several UN organizations are seeking some level of control over the subject of internet governance and other outcomes of WISIS. So, when we used to just be able to follow what was going on at WISIS in Geneva, then in Tunisia, now we have as stakeholders to carefully monitor a multi-headed hydra of organizations that could alter the scope of internet governance very easily. So besides paying close attention to the annual internet governance forum, we must keep an eye on the International Telecommunications Union, which has just changed its entire strategic plan to reflect its desire to become a leader in internet governance issues, and we have to track the actions of UNESCO, who also will have a piece of the action. Now, I can't do it alone, nor can SLA. We need your help. I would urge all of you to become participants or at least active observers in this unfolding international drama. At stake is the future of the internet your internet, our internet, and its potential as the most significant medium for change since the invention of the printing press. Make no mistake about it though, some determined politicians and global economic powers will continue to do all they can to limit broad access to and the use of information. So please don't ever forget the adage that information is power and by supporting a strong international commitment to unfettered access to information and to transparency on a global scale, we will be able to ultimately benefit all the people on this planet. By getting involved with your peers on this issue, either directly through SLA, through your own professional association, or your government, you will not only have a front row seat for the most significant debates of our lifetime, you could have a direct influence on your profession and those you serve. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Janice, for that thoughtful analysis. I don't know about you, but I've been trying to follow this on the web. And, and when I looked the first time a couple of years ago, there were pages and pages of participants. And it, it was really hard for me to get to the there there. So I think this analysis will help you think through what's important to read. Janice is willing to take some questions. Jesus asked about the privatization of the internet and whether that was included in any of the discussions about internet governance. And I was saying that, that yes, it was mostly as one of the things that could really be disruptive to the free flow of information. Um, there, there are strong commitments to broad principles. Just about every nation even some that may surprise you will stand up and say they are for the free flow of information. But then when it comes down to whether somebody can gain economically by a privatization initiative, um, whether the information that is free flowing is something that can make the government unstable, then things you know, start to get problematic. So it is one of the things Jesus, that everyone involved in this is keeping an eye on to make sure that the internet remains sort of this very robust um, uh, mechanism or medium that can benefit from the talents of nuclear physicists all the way down to the 13-year-old who created YouTube or, you know, and, and is at work on it every day. So it is, in fact, an important issue and one that we believe is very important to make sure doesn't compromise the, the Internet's vibrancy. The, the question was about the, the scope of 
the people in developing nations who cannot access the internet and, and don't have it available to them and what some of the challenges are. Um, I, I can't give you a number or anything like that, but I think it is far greater than any of us imagined. We think, for example, particularly in the library community, that most libraries now around the world are connected to the internet. And in fact, in many, many continents, that is not the case. And sometimes it's because there's no infrastructure, including some of the basic things. Barbara and I were talking this morning. It's, it's not just having the, the cable connection or the internet connection. It's fundamental things such as no electricity or electricity only part of the day or you know some of the things that we take for granted you know no telephone wires I mean you look at a nation like China who never wired its country for phones they went right from no phones to cell phones you know so it, you know there are um, there are huge logistical challenges which means their financial and economic challenges because it takes a lot of money to fix those. I also worry about the challenges that governments place on their own people. Um, I, I'm no expert in this, but it we, re, we all read the newspapers. We know that there are major nations around the world who believe that their citizens do not need to know some information or should not have access to information. So I actually think it's a two-pronged issue where in some nations it really is an economic issue. People, they just don't have the resources to get the electricity, the connectivity, the, the wires, the pipes, the things that you need. But I think probably, in my mind at least, um, a more dire situation is where you have a government of a country that has the resources but chooses not to let their citizens have access to information. So I think it's a two-pronged issue. And I think if you take both of those, it's probably most of the people in the world at this point who do not have access to the internet. Yes, in the back row. Uh, the, the question was that there's another aspect to this access issue, which is that some governments, whether intentionally or not, and the example was the US government, which is taking information and reports, government information and reports off of the internet and making it unavailable to its citizens, particularly because much of the information now is only in a digital format. So if it's not on the open web, then how do you, how, how do US citizens or citizens of any country have access to it? And I think that is also a very, very critical uh, situation. It's the argument we are currently having, um, SLA, ALA, all of the library associations are involved with a debate with the Environmental Protection Agency because they are closing their libraries and digitizing their one-of-a-kind reports and documentation and government information. So um, like I was saying before, the battle is not only in what is traditionally known as developing countries. It is, it is one where we have to be vigilant around the world. The, the question was, is the internet also not only an opportunity and a tool for libraries, but also a threat to libraries? Because, and let me par make sure that I'm paraphrasing you correctly, that if people assume, whether it's government officials or in, a lot of times with special libraries association, the corporate officials believe that any information is available on the internet, therefore you don't need an information center or a library to help get it for you. That is something that we spend a lot of time on. And it's interesting how I actually think the tide may have turned. Um, it's going to be slow, but for many, many years, um, SLA members were losing their jobs because their bosses felt as though all this information could be accessed through the internet and I think now 
that there is so much information available that people are almost drowning and it. it's a little like drinking out of a fire hose. People are coming to recognize, people in leadership positions are coming to recognize that you need professional help to sort through it and find what's valid, what is quality information, what is relevant to your particular decision making. So it is, it is not I don't think I'm going to live to declare victory over that problem. I don't I think SLA will I think SLA will have kicked me to the curb long before we can say we have beat that. So it's something that all professional associations are working on and making sure that the internet supplements what it is, the services and the professionalism that our members provide, but it is a tough sell, particularly when libraries are considered overhead, when they're not considered a vital part of the mission, when, uh, particularly in, a, in the private sector, when people are working from you know, quarterly profit reports to the next quarterly profit report and not particularly thinking strategically anymore. So keep us, keep us on it. Hold our feet to the fire. Yes. Oh, there's one here. One here. Let me do this. Not. Yeah. Yeah. The qu the question is that in the in the good old days when the internet was manageable, <laughs> um, that you could you could take a snapshot of it. You could take a picture of it and save it on a CD or whatever. I mean, I have the CD of the OPM website on the day that I left office in 2001. Now I dare say, you know. I don't know how big the CD would be, but you know it, it probably can't happen anymore. And the question was whether the IGF has this on its agenda to to do. And the the IGF doesn't actually do anything <laughs> except happen once a year and provide a forum for discussion. So. You know, that is certainly one of the things that ends up getting discussed, and I think it ties into Jesus's question early on about the privatization of the Internet, because I dare say at this point, and again, I don't, I don't claim to be an expert on these topics because they're so complex, and I just happen to be lucky to be an observer at a few of these, a few of, of these forums, but you know, who, you know, when you think about who now could actually pull that off, that, that technological miracle of taking a snapshot or something, it would be a probably a really big company that many of you may have made money on if you invested early. It starts, starts with G, the next two letters are OO, but it, that's in the private sector. You know, that's not necessarily available to all of us. And, you know, I, I love their, their slogan, you know, do no evil. You know, I, you got to love it. But what are they going to do with that information that they're gathering? And I think that, you know, as stewards of the free flow of information of some of these principles, we have to hold their feet to the fire as well. I mean, the other organizations that come to my mind are, you know, intelligence organizations um, of, you know, major national players. They're not going to let us see it. You know, they're not going to make it available. You know, I can't imagine the, the CIA doing this and then handing it over to the Library of Congress, you know, just as a, as a good deed or, you know, whatever the equivalents are in, in Russia or China or, you know, any other major players across the globe. So. So I think you're right to worry about that. And I think that a lot of information gets lost on a daily basis um, in, that we will never recover again. So it's, um, it's something that hopefully we can get smarter about as a, as a global community because I do worry that a lot of important things are falling by the wayside. And not just my Facebook account. So that you know, that wouldn't count. One more question. You've been very patient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, the, the question was, you know, for those of us who haven't kept up with it, is there a single uh, place where we could go find this information? I, I wish I knew what that was because I'd be using it. 
but um, no, we, we are constantly surprised by the amount of activity that goes on in this arena. I still go to meetings with the U.S. State Department and I learn a lot there. I go to meetings with the industry stakeholders in the United States and I learn a lot there. Um, your, your professional associations, I think, are both the way to, to learn about the issue but also a way to contribute about the issue. I mean, I, I have no qualms saying I need help in this. And, you know, if somebody sees an article about it, you know, Janice at SLA.org, you know, shoot it to me. I mean, because chances are I will not have seen it. No one on my staff will have had a chance to dig it out. There is so much activity in this area that it truly is staggering. Now, on the other hand, um, we know there are some very specific things that happen. We know that the Internet Governance Forum will be held for five years, at least, once a year for five years. They had one in Athens. The next one is mid-November in Rio de Janeiro. You know, if you can go, great. If you can't be there, they video stream, they podcast, they do all sorts of things. There's a way to at least learn from that, if, even if you can't participate directly in person. So I would just urge you, and those of you from Mexico, your government is very involved in this. I'm sorry I don't know more about where you could go for information in the United States. The U.S. State Department has the lead, although there's lots of involvement by other departments as well. But I would urge you to go back, and even if, it, you know, even if you don't agree with everything I've said in this in this speech, please try to find a way to promote your views on this because we need people who are going to have the perspective of libraries and information professionals and move that agenda forward, even though we may not always be 100% in sync. Let me just tell you, I was the only representative of a library association in Athens for the Internet Governance Forum. I met other librarians, but they were there in other roles. You know, they'd gotten other jobs in other organizations. So people did approach me, and the librarian for UNESCO was there. So, so there were librarians, but they weren't there promoting the library agenda. So, it, you know, it's, and it's not about me. It just happens that I got very, very interested in this a year or so ago and have really wanted to follow it. But actually two years ago now, time flies, but um, I can't do it alone. So please help me out, get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Now that was just an appetizer and wasn't that good. Yeah. So I hope you'll enjoy uh, the rest of the programs today, and I will see you about, and uh, thank you very much, Janice. Thank you for joining us. We hope you return for part two of 4.0, 2007, where Dennis Escarhala, ASU law professor, will discuss international copyright in the digital age.